Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Ryan Dominguez, and I am the Artistic Director of Passage Theater and the Director of our upcoming production of the OK uh, Trenton Project. Um, just a quick overview of the show. Um, the OK Trenton Project follows the story of a sculpture that was put up in the summer of 2017 um, called Helping Hands. And it was a sculpture that was created by uh, a group of students who were in a summer camp called Camp Mercer. Camp Mercer uh, was um, produced by Homefront, the organization's Homefront, Isles and Grounds for Sculpture as a partnership to give these students um, a fun summer experience. In the, um, uh, during the camp, the students created a sculpture that was in the shape of a, a hand symbol saying, okay, um, it was made out of pots and pans. Um, uh, about the day the sculpture was put up, it was put up at the corner of Perry and Montgomery Street in Trenton um, when an anonymous police officer called the Trentonian newspaper um, and suggested that the statue uh, was a gang symbol for the Bloods and ultimately the statue was taken down two days later. We uh, at Passage created a play, um, we used that event as a jumping off point for a play where we did over 35 interviews with uh, community members, uh, students, uh, city officials, artists throughout the city uh, to find out what happened uh, to the OK, uh, to the Helping Hand sculpture and what that meant to our community. Um, and we will be running the show. It previews on February 10th and it runs from February 12th through 27th. We are using tonight uh, as a way to hear from some of the members of our community about what they think uh, is uh, art as activism uh, related to the sculpture and more. Um, so we really appreciate you being here and we really appreciate you um, sharing your voice with us. Tonight, uh, I, and I will let um, the people on the panel introduce themselves, but our moderator tonight is our dear friend, Cherry Oakley. Uh, Cherry, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Ryan. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome uh, to our first conversation. Uh, um, I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists that will be sharing their thoughts um, and things tonight. Um, the first um, up um, is uh, Tamara Torres. Uh, Tamara is an interdisciplinary artist, um, social justice act activist, and mother based in Trenton. Uh, Tam uh, Tamara's artistic work is varied and presented in multiple mediums, such as narrative collages, abstract painted mindscapes, and performance. Her artistic practice knits together advocacy for women's rights, racial equity, and her own autobiographical experience. Tamara leads community art workshops, including Fabrica de Fotos, a student and mentors photography club, the Trenton Feminist Book Club, and she is a student of Afro-Latino Americano Studies. This spring, Kane University's Helen Berger Gallery will host Tamara's solo ex 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 exhibition, Profundo, featuring new artwork, offering a glimpse into Afro-Latinx roots and abstract landscapes, revealing light through the deepest darkness. Tamara is, ex, has exhibited internationally, including this year's International Women's Day Art Connects Women in the United Arab Emirates. There's also Jonathan Connor, also known as Link. Um, he's an artist, designer, and educator from Trenton, a graduate of Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland, Oregon. Um, he's designed his own artwork and signage for Whole Foods Markets and created educational content for Utrecht Art Supplies. Um, currently works for Monmouth University and he teaches drawing, two-dimensional design, and digital media at Mercer County Community College. So you can check him out there. Um, he's a founding member of the city's beautification nonprofit, SAGE, and has been working with public art organizations, Albus Cavus, since 2008, participating in public art and mural projects along the East Coast. And then we have Allison Eisenberg. She's a professor of history at Princeton University and co-director of the Princeton Mellon Initiative in Architecture, Urbanism, and Humanities. She's currently writing Uprisings, which takes... Uh, the April 1968 civil unrest in Trenton 
and it's that it's as a starting point. Eisenberg is also a co-producer for Harlan B. Joseph was here, and a docu that's a documentary film by Purcell Carson scheduled for release in 2023, um, and this is about a Trenton story. Eisenberg and Carson's collaborative teaching and research received the 2019 Award of Recognition from New Jersey's Historical Commission. Um, and recently, the NEH supported uprisings with the 2021 Fellowship. And Eisenberg's other books are Downtown America, A History of the Place and the People Who Made, who made It, and Designing San Francisco Art, Land, and Urban Renewal in the City by the Bay, and she's previously taught at Rutgers University. And I want to just check really quickly the money in. Just check really quick. Uh, right, I am not seeing. All right, so we're going to have another panelist join us um, in a bit. Um, uh, but until that, I um, also want to thank the Trenton Free Public Library and Process um, for their support um, of tonight. All right, I'm going to take some questions out to our panelists. I'm going to ask each of you to think. When someone says to you, art as activism, what pops into your head? Allison, you like to start? You start with A. Right. Sure. Um, that's a really great question. Um, and I think that most kind of works of art or actions of art um, are in some ways activism for something, like some idea, some point, you know, something that needs to be said. So maybe like the most kind of open, to me, like that would be the most open definition. Um, of, uh, you know, that, that, that really at heart, maybe all art is activist for something. Link. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, from, from my perspective as somebody who works out of doors um, and, you know, in the world, um, uh, I don't know if like everything I necessarily do, uh, constitutes, you know, uh, what we're talking about, but, you know, I mean, I feel like even, you know, you know most of my work is to elicit, uh, like, a laugh or a smile in most cases versus, you know, real kind of deep messaging, although that gets in there sometimes, but I think, you know, that in the world is, is an act that uh, you're trying to get people to, to react to, so, um, yeah, and then I think it can go as far as, you know, truly, um, you know, revolutionary uh, works of art um, and things like that, where there's a very clear and, and powerful message for stuff. Thank you. And Tamara, am I saying your name properly, Tamara? Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, I, for me, I think of, I, I think of healing like the word healing automatically pops up for me. Um, I think that when we create arts for activism, it's not initially for, it begins as a healing process and then is a private one and then eventually becomes a public one, which may then create these little revolutionary like ripple effects all around. But I think for me, the initial word that automatically pops in my head is healing, you know? Yeah. So when we're thinking, thinking about that, um, activism oftentimes stems, stems from a collective, powerful emotional response, it's whether it's collective anger, collective sadness, or, you know, elated joy. And if we think about the use of that collective emotion in the act of create, creation, right, the act of initiating healing, as you're describing, how does that col that collective emotional response contribute to the act of creation and the creation of art when you think about what each of you have done? Uh, 
Anybody just leap in? Oh, yeah, I guess I'll, I mean, I'll go first. So, um, okay, so I have, you know, a, a two-part process, uh, really, which is, since I make stencils for most of mom, um, what it is that I'm putting out uh, into the world, um, I'm spending a lot of time in the studio working through those. That's sort of my meditative uh end of that and gives me really time to think about you know what it is i'm making um and why um and then the secondary part of that is actually installing it on the wall where you're interacting with people and talking with them about what you're doing and why or you know what the image is going to be and um in many cases getting their input about what they think you should be painting or um what should be getting done um I think it, it sort of helps me, um, you know, understand how people see things. It, it, it's easy to kind of get in your uh, your own headspace about what you're making and why, uh, but then immediately being able to get people's reactions on the street, which isn't something that happens for every, like sometimes you're only getting feedback at a gallery show or, you know, people might see your paintings and never be able to talk to you about it. So. I think it's a really interesting uh, part of, of working in the public sphere and um, having the opportunity to get immediate feedback uh, about what people think about it and whether you know they think what you thought and, and how you can build from that. Thank you for that. Tamara. I think that um, in my opinion, the most wonderful thing about artists is that we're able to almost create a voice for a lot of people who might have things hidden inside their frustrations or whatever. We're able to create images or stories or share things in a different way for them to um, be able to feel connected to something, you know? So for me, anytime I've created any kind of art that I guess um, people will look at like, oh, this is like for activism, this is like protest. It was very personal and private. Sometimes is is a very, private process, it's a healing process, it's a quiet one, is is whatever frustrations I'm dealing with or whatever it is that's happening in society that I, I want to speak out, it begins like in my little space, in my bubble. And then if if it's if I decide to show it, if I decide to put the work out there or other people come across it, then I feel like now it belongs to them. Now is their voice, now is their, their point of view. Now they can take the work however they want to. They can feel that I we either have the same voice, someone's talking with them, we can conversate on them, um, or they may just look at it and be like, oh, that's cool, and then that's it. You know, like, it just depends, like, on the individual. So, yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I would say, since I spend a lot of time uh, looking at the 1960s, that it would be kind of important to start by saying that there wasn't a lot of what we would think of as like traditional public art, you know, in most cities, like even the big corporate funded sculptures and stuff that were public art or mural projects like Philadelphia is famous for its mural projects. Those were more, those like emerged in the 1960s. So I think that when you're looking at the 1960s that collective kinds of actions for me would be like um, marches and, you know, picketing. And that, that like when you're connecting collective action to art that, and you think of marches as performance and maybe something that it maybe strangely to me as a historian, like really important marches and really tiny marches that both get kind of forgotten. And like in Trenton, an example of a really famous collect, famous collective march uh, with tons of signs and like, like hundreds of signs and thousands of people participating was the it was the march on Trenton in October 
1963, and it followed the March on Washington. And it was supposed to be the first of many like marches on like state capitals to, to carry forward the momentum for um, civil rights legislation and, and civil rights act. But I think most people, you know, don't know about that march on Trenton. And I think that like itself, it was a really spectacular procession, you know, just itself. But then it also could be a source of inspiration, you know, for artists today who work in, you know, this is like a very public, there, I'm sure there's private stories to it, you know, behind the scenes, you can read about, you know, who pulled it together and why it happened. But like, I think that would be um, kind of an example of the role that historians can help with just by bringing, like, you know, sometimes just like it takes that digging if it doesn't just come out in people's stories and talking to their grandkids, um, you know, then it takes the digging to, to bring it out and then people can look at it and they can think about that collective um, activism. But like in the 60s, I, I think that kind of art activism um, spectrum was happening a lot with marches. And that's where as a state capital, Trenton was really a magnet for marches, um, you know, hunger strikes on the, you know, the steps of the Capitol, things like that, that, uh, you know, sometimes were documented by the press. And then, you know, so we have a pretty decent record of it. So, yeah, so that, like thinking about the 60s, that's where my, that's where my, um, that's where my thoughts go. Oh, wow, thank you. Yeah, that's, um, I don't know, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, and it's sort of, right now, the uh, last, Last year, I guess, we did a series of um, murals based on photos from the 2020 demonstrations. So I think it might be interesting to think about, um, you know, finding some archival images and, and stuff like that and kind of getting a variety of art based on protest photos together. Each of you have have a connection um, to Trenton um, and have done some work in Trenton. And if you think about this kind of concept of, of history um, and the evolution of art um, in this city um, and looking at the, the impact of the piece of art that brought us all together um, today, uh, what, what could you all share around um, what you know of the the evolution of art and and the reaction to it um, here in the city from what you're experiencing. Um, I actually had thought about this question a lot. Um, I was I was born and raised here, and I remember. Um, and this is my opinion. This is Tamara Torres' childhood slash opinion. You know, <laughs> so if someone remembers different, by all means you know, share it later. Um, but I do remember, I didn't see growing up in Trenton, a lot of murals and a lot of art pro projects, a lot of art programming, or at least I wasn't a part of it, but definitely did not see murals or the things that I see now in, in that in Trenton community, in the art community, because it's so powerful. So I just, I want to really quickly congratulate all the artists that sort of created this like ripple effect with doing the murals and, and kind of being, I think going rogue and then like creating this big tidal wave where everyone now realizes how important it is and how important it is for the community and just sort of like kind of taking from them and, you know, and all of that. So that by itself is a whole other thing, but definitely for me growing up, I, I did not remember seeing a lot of this as, as it is now. And I'm so happy that, you know, now a lot of the students that I worked with or whatever, they, the first thing they comment is all the murals in the city. They, they know things are happening. They know artists are here. Um, they can almost sense that they can make a career as an artist. And I'm speaking as myself as an artist. So I really, that's my, my history, I guess, when it comes to Trenton arts in the past. And I just, I don't remember it. And I'm, so ecstatic that I'm here now, just 
in it and part of it because you know in the future when they talk about the city of Trent and I know that I was there when it was all happening when it was coming out of the woodworks Lank uh yeah well I mean I think when I think about traditional public art um in Trenton a lot of it is based on the city's very old history uh you know revolutionary war stuff I would say that's the the bulk of what we had, um, and a lot of that is sculptural in nature. And then because we're the capital and there's X number of dollars put aside per state project for public art, there are, there are lots of good pieces, but those are usually, those were not really coming from inside the city and aren't, weren't necessarily serving, um, the community. They were based um, you know, whoever was in charge um, at the time. And a lot of the painting, there's some painting and murals, a lot of that is inside buildings. So it's sort of, uh, you know, separated out um, from the public. So while it is technically public art and that they are in public buildings, you don't necessarily know that they're there or know where to find them or, or can see them. Um, so, you know, uh, like Tamara said, I'm happy that um, we're moving towards a model where the people of the city are determining what the art is and and what things what the the landscape is is going to look like. Um, so you know, I'm looking forward to reading in it about about it in the history books too with with Tamara. So. Making your own history. Hey, here yeah. you. <laughs> I think that sounds like a really great um, kind of research project would be to find out, to start from the question of like where, because uh, like at some point, like maybe in the 1990s or, to, you know, early 20th, uh, 21st century, that there's like a move toward new kinds of public art, different from what Lang just described, like the kind of sculptures and monuments and, and that type of thing. And it would be really interesting to document like, how those like late 20th century um, artists emerged, because you know there were artists in Trenton, right? And so the question is like, well, what were they doing? You know, so a project could just simply be finding who the active artists were in Trenton in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and just like, why, you know, were they doing indoor, you know, art or like what were they doing art that was displayed in other cities or, uh, but but I think like what you I, I happen to be from Hartford, Connecticut, and I think like what you just described, uh, both both of you just described is is kind of typical of smaller cities like, you know, it's we're not Philadelphia, you know, and and there wasn't a big grassroots kind of like public artist movement. And so and the architecture, you know, became something that people talked about a little bit as like a kind of art thing, you know, like there's this fancy constitution plaza, urban renewal thing that looks like a boat that was built. And so everybody talked about that, probably a little bit like people must have talked about the state office complexes and everything, because they were really different, like they had different shapes and they were not like the rest of the city. So maybe the architecture at some level was seen as having like, that could be a project too, like looking into like what all of these new state buildings meant as a, as like what did it say about government and jobs and you know culture and you know um, policing and like all the different things that come with the government. So so maybe the architecture too in Trenton might be something not not the old architecture necessarily, although that's really interesting. You know the desire to fix that up and you know keep the old buildings and you know, like other, like Georgetown or Philadelphia Society Hill. I mean, you know, um, Mill Hill had that too. But, you know, but just like that, maybe adding architecture is something that could get um, some attention as well, like what it meant to people. Nice. You know, you, when, you're, when you're driving around, this, traveling around the city, the place that you live and work and play and worship every day, you never think of, 
of architecture as the presence of art around you all the time. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, I want to back up and, and um, pick up something that Tamara, you said, um, which was the, you know, this groundswell, grassroots ripple effect of people going rogue <laughs> and creating art. Um, um, and and when you when I think about that kind of concept of going rogue and, and looking to um, what policies might exist around it that guide our architectural design and and whatnot, it, um, um, oftentimes um, systems, government systems and whatnot will try to create policy to guide what happens, um, either in reaction to something or to preempt something to 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 build um or to to manage um and when i when i think about kind of the the event that brought us together um on this panel um you know uh, i know there's lots of things and lots of comments and thoughts and, and whatnot that's been out there um amongst the community in reaction to what happened with the removal of this um this piece of art um and and so you know people think well gosh what you know what was the policy what was the guidance that they were given before they put that up so that they didn't have to pull all their hard work into the creation of this and have it ripped away um and so i'm curious what do you all think about what happens when you don't have policy around art making and then on the other hand what happens when you do uh, all right. Well, I mean, I feel like I'm in an interesting position to answer this question um, <clears throat> because there, I mean, there have been some conversations about whether we, <clears throat> excuse me, whether we need some sort of um, public art policy, um, you know, who exactly that is, who do they speak for, uh, things of that nature. So I'm, I'm sort of of two minds because I would like to see some um, leadership, some some guidance, some budgeting, uh, probably more than anything else uh, for public art projects in the city. Um, but I came from, I started in a place where with no rules, you can do whatever you want. And I know I'm not the only one who kind of likes that model um, and uh, sort of uh, would rather ask for forgiveness than permission. And, um, you know, but when you get into a situation where, you know, it, as far as a, a muralist is concerned, if something gets painted over, I mean, that's kind of, that's, it is what it is. I mean, and some, places that's an invitation to put something new up um, and in other times it's a signal that that's probably not the best spot to uh, to do something um, with something like uh, the okay trenton project and and that actual piece of sculpture uh, that's a little bit more that's where i do see sort of the uh, the necessity of of decision maker somewhere along the line that says, you know, yes, you can, you know, this could go here. Um, and it also really stresses the importance of um, talking to the community for where something is going to go. Um, and, you know, from a grassroots perspective, that talking to the community, like I said, being out on the wall, that has informed what has ended up being the final product of a mural set. People will say oh can you put oh this person used to live here uh they passed away can you you know can you work something like like that and can we get you know some sort of memorial um and that is you know that's really the ideal situation and the people who are going to see it every day are have you know ownership and, and have a stake in what's happening um you know and then there's like the Helping Hands sculpture, which in many other contexts, in almost every single context, is completely harmless. But in on, in that one 
space viewed through a certain lens, um, it probably wasn't the right thing to go there. And certainly with, you know, not having any kind of explanation of what it was and who made it and, and why it was there, which was coming as far as I, I understand, but, you know, sort of that's where policy or um, oversight, I think, is helpful. Even if, you know, I as an artist don't agree with what ultimately gets put up someplace, um, I at least understand that there, the conversation happens and, you know, we're not putting this here because of that, but maybe there's someplace else. That can so that's, that's where I am. I'm all for doing whatever you want, wherever you want. <laughs> and, you know, until it's a problem, I guess. Tamara. Um, this will be really short because I'm not a muralist. <laughs> when I think ab about uh, policy, right? And like versus going rogue, so I'm gonna call it going rogue. I think, you know, as artists, like, yeah, we can absolutely go on rogue. It's like the most real emotion and it's not controlled. It's just like actually coming out of you, whatever it is that you're trying to put out everything right with the okay symbol you know having policy for me it's like just involve involving the community first talking to the community about what you're going to put out there talking to the community about why it got taken out because if the community and those policies were put in that place in a proper place then maybe that police officer wouldn't look at it and go oh yeah that's like a gang symbol that's good. then it would be the community versus that because that conversation all of that was created i don't know if it was it wasn't i guess i'll find out when i check out the play i can't wait but i definitely think that this that's one of the things that um when i think of policies i think of that i think community especially with public public arts when i'm i'm thinking about um and i also kind of enjoy the fact that there are artists out there who would go rogue in their communities who would actually um, present and do murals and things that enlift the community itself, that they need to see this, right? They need to feel these emotions and see all that. Um, and when, who's creating these policies, right? Who's like the principal, like who's doing this? Like, you know, so those type of people can also almost destroy the um, real honesty of art in a big way within the communities that need it, you know? So instead of, and like, you can tell me if I'm wrong, you can jump in here anytime because I feel like somehow I'm always getting a little bit of trouble. But, you know, when you create these kind of certain policies, certain people putting these policies, right, um, it can go from wanting to put like a Black Lives Matter mural to no, can you just put like rainbows and butterflies? Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's just, it depends on exactly who is creating these policies, what's happening with the community, who's talking to the community about these murals and big things that are happening. Right. And let, letting the artist, if you're going to give an artist a job, give the artist a job, let them do what they're going to do without controlling the creativity behind it. You know what I mean? So I think that's my um, my point of view on this. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a, a balancing act of like creative freedom for an artist to, you know, create whatever it is they want. And most people who do that understand a, a work of public art is going to be seen by many and varied people and everybody's going to have a different opinion so you're mm. never going to make everybody happy um but you want to find that balance of i think it's really more these are the places you can do or, or these these are you know mm -hmm. permission uh funding and then the creativity and the and the vision should be up to you know the artist. Now, if there's a panel of people who decide which artist that is, I mean, that's kind of what I'm interested in finding out and what I'm trying to do um, with artworks and public projects. There is find find that balance of, of kind mm -hmm. of creativity and, and permission and making okay. sure the artist is getting paid. And the OK sign is also not the first that have been just taken out in the community. There's a lot of um, murals and 
kind of things that happened in Trenton that I had just kind of been snatched away without conversations from the community, without like acceptance. So I think it's just maybe the okay sign began this conversation, which is like a great conversation we all need to have. But let's just, I'm just putting that out there. It's not like the. Well, one of our, it's, it's funny that you say that, Tamara, because one of our um, audience members, Duncan Harrison, indicated in 2014 that Michael, the Michael Brown mural was painted over due to the express concern of the Trenton Police Department. And in 20, 2017, the Helping Hand sculpture was removed because of a similar concern. So Duncan was curious, what type of message do you think these actions send to the community and to future artists? Well, I'm just going to jump in here real quick because I was somewhat in, tangentially related to both of those uh, things in that um, it's kind of what happened, like what Tamara was talking about with like grassroots stuff happening. Then the there was sort of blanket permission from the city to do to be to what I was just saying to express the artists to express themselves as they saw fit, and then that kind of you, we saw where the line was on that, and it was pretty obvious. Um, the sort of the sad part about both of those being taken down is there was there was some talk that there would be a conversation between the artists and the people who requested it being taken down. And that never really uh, came to be. Um, and I think specifically with the Michael, like, you know, the, a piece of art is only as, you know, dangerous as uh, people just decide that it is. in most cases, it's not really if you're upset by something, you have to kind of look into yourself and ask you know, why. Um, so I think, you know, especially with the Michael Brown mural, like it was pretty obvious what the problem was. There was, you know, kind of expressing the thoughts and feelings of the people in that community through a piece of art. Um, and then how, you know, law enforcement react to that, reacted to it sort of tells the story of the, the the problem that we already had. There's like disconnect between the people policing um, the city and, and the people who, who live there, so. Allison, did you? Yeah, so I, I think that the pattern of the two um, incidents in 2014 and 2017, I mean, what it shows is that even though you don't have an official arts policy, it shows that you have an unofficial arts policy, which is being run by the police department. So you would have to like acknowledge that and go right at it. If that's the case, if the police are the arts policy, then that kind of leads you in one direction, right? And, and you would work with that explicitly, uh, either, you know, just to go at it, or maybe that's part of the reason why maybe it's not a bad idea to have um, something that is explicitly declared as an arts policy because otherwise you have a default. You, you do have a default arts policy. Um, and I also think this might be a case where, you know, the, the historical example, you know, might be helpful, which is like, usually people disagree about something that's put in as art, right? I mean, there's almost never agreement. Some people are mad, people want it removed, you know, other people support it, but they support it for different reasons. And I, I've always understood that that was kind of the purpose is that people could have open disagreement or somebody loves it and someone else makes fun of them. You know, it, it's just like, that's the, the, everyone laughs together, you know, like that is part of the value. And so to think that, you know, you are judging something you know, as dangerous um, is, is, it seems like kind of counter to the idea of what at least, you know, are in the public world is, is for, you know, and it might be interesting to just think about, like, if, if there's something that, um, you know, the, the police are afraid of, you know, what, it might be worth like looking, are there other examples where 
a mural has actually caused a harm? You know, like it, it just to like to to face it as a real question. You know, is that what you're worried about? You know, is you think it's going to be like a place where people will gather or like what's the actual problem? You know, if it's it, you know like it just concretely like can can we look at this and just like look at other places and say do we have other examples? Because I, I actually, as a historian, I'm really having a hard time, you know, really coming up with them. <laughs> so, so it would be a, maybe a helpful exercise. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Now, I was, I was just thinking about the, um, you, that it's interesting you bring this kind of, de you have a default policy that you didn't even actively engage in creating. Um, and with with people, you know, utilizing that collective energy or that collective thought to cr to craft art um, that may be uh, put forth as healing or maybe put put forth as protest. And historically, we've looked at um, uh, protest um, often to being a, a nonviolent protest being perceived as dangerous. So if we think about art and art making and all the different mediums um, that art um, can take. Um, do you, what do you, I'm curious of what, what you all think about in terms of art um, supporting nonviolent protest. And what forms, you know, might do that? Tamara. Sure. This is another question I had to like sit with in my mind <laughs> for a little bit. Um, I guess personally for me, and I'm speaking on, on, you know, Tamara Torres, I think for me is creating, um, creating projects and workshops like the Fabrica de Fotos. For me, that's one. That's a, it's a personal thing that I'm doing. So when I got, it's something that just happened during the, um, everyone's quarantining the pandemic, the kids are in school. This is simple grabbing some students talking about uh, photography and then inviting other Trenton photographers to join in conversations with them and then having a small exhibition. Um, a lot of the students, some of them, I'm going to say, all of majority of them learned a lot about not only photographers, but photographers from their own culture, their own background, photographers of a color, like from where they came from. And then some of them fell in love and started to take photos and understood they wanted to become photographers. They understood the whole thing. Those are little ways of me of doing protests that is nonviolent. I'm actually working with community, right? You just you're doing it in a way where there's no need to um, get all crazy. You're doing it in small packets with ways you can control as a person, you know. Um, and I think a lot of people in the city of Trenton have done that in their own ways. They work with students. They work with communities. They they give out food on Sundays. They give out, they just like all these little pockets um, creating gardens. I don't know, where is she? Driving me crazy, but creating like gardens for the community and doing these little things. Those are so important. And those are ways to create these protests that are just like nonviolent. They're just there for the people, for the community and create little ripples effects of change, right? Like that, I mean, that's for me, that's the best way. Um, just being able to just like, you know, educate and build and try. Just, you don't have to, you have PhD, you can just do what you can. Yeah, excellent. There, um, I see in the chat, uh, Roland Pot uh, is putting forth a question to you all. Um, he says, while he's in favor of good policy, he also thinks that artists should have the opportunity to be creative and the government shouldn't tell artists what to paint or create as happened in totalitarian states. Any thoughts on how, how, how to have good policy that helps ensure that there's good quality art without limiting artistic expression? Well, I mean, that's what I'm in the process of trying to figure out right now. Um, just by looking at um, what other cities are doing. Um, the, one of the, the more difficult parts is finding comparable uh, places. We are a, a unique uh, city in our relatively small size um, 
sort of um, a lot of people who come here to work but then leave. Um, and uh, a, a lack of, uh, I think, funding for lack of, I've said that a lot, but that's really the key to both attracting, uh, you know, really good um, artists and creating work on a scale that can actually have an impact. Obviously, you know, the smaller the piece of work, the sort of, the, in most cases, the smaller reach um, it's gonna have. Um, so really, I, I think it's about, you know, it's, Having a bureaucracy, but a bureaucracy that's sort of run by people who understand what it is to be an artist, what it is the artists are trying to do, um, versus maybe a policy run by a bunch of people who don't necessarily know, uh, you know what goes into it, the struggles, uh, things like that. So I, I think it, it, in some cases it's about building uh, that policy from the ground up with a lot of artist input um, versus sort of top down. This is how this is what our policy is going to be, and that's you know it's frustrating sometimes as an artist. And I, I'm not a, the biggest fan of meetings and things like that, but I think it's kind of necessary um, if you're going to uh, you know like you say, have a, 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 a good policy that works, that prevents things from being taken down quickly, um, but also doesn't prevent things from going up as well, if that makes sense. Um, and just to touch on your last question. Um, so one of the things that I think was a catalyst to where we are now as a arts city um, was the 219 gallery and the stuff we were doing um, with Sage where the, the, the protest or the activism was just a matter of activating a space um, in the town and then that kind of radiating out a little bit and getting people to come in. Basically um, starting doing shows and murals um, in a place where people would tell you not to, but for lack of a better uh, way to say that, you know, everybody's like, why are you doing that there? And that, that I think is, if anybody asks you why you're doing something that you're probably doing it in the right place, um, because that means you're actually affecting uh, people and doing things. So I think, you know, active activism that can really be just, doing something or anything, making people in a neighborhood feel like oh, they're worth it and they have value and that neighborhood has value. Allison, you look like you were leaning in, like you wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah, just a small point that's on my mind. Just, it seems like, um, like one of the policy sides would be to, you know, to have a community where you know, artists would know that there are places that their work will land. And I think that's part of the uncertainty, you know, like you were talking about, you know, like the importance of, um, you know, community gardens. And I know like people have so many good ideas that, and it's hard if it's like city owned land, for example, like a vacant lot, or it's, it's often city owned property, but how do, how do regular people actually get permission you know it, it's kind of a basic question but one that must cross people's minds all the time like I have this really great idea you know my neighbors want to do this but I'm not sure you know I it's like a question is like would a resident know how to bring a really good idea forward you know to the right city agencies like where would they start did they would they know where to start you know is it the parks department or the vacant land or, or you know like where where would you go? And I think maybe that's part of ensuring, you know, that good ideas and artists' good ideas and citizens' good ideas could be supported. Um, and then the other policy part is that, you know, that people would have ways of um, 
being financially supported too, because if it's a major contribution to transform and activate public space, and, and it always has been, right? I mean, even just like a beautiful boulevard or it just inspires people. So like to acknowledge that, the value that's added and so that there's, you know, as you were saying, like that you know you can make a living or, or that it's valued and it, it will be paid work. Um, you know, that is something that policies all, always helped, you know, arts policies that make money available to artists, whether through their housing or, you know, through purchasing their work or guaranteeing that it will have a place that it will be displayed. You know, it, just all of those kinds of factors are, they do have policy sides and, you know, they shouldn't just depend on, like in the 1960s, there was also like all this corporate uh, benevolence, which was great, you know, really wonderful to have artists paid for, you know, sculptures and stuff paid by um, insurance companies and that kind of thing. But, but it's also really important to have the public policies and not just rely on the benevolence of, of and, and the ability of businesses, because, you know, you might have mostly small businesses and all the small businesses want an activated, you know, public realm, but they don't necessarily have the resources. Like if you're a bakery or a shoe shop, you know, you can't sponsor a sculpture. So I think that's the policy side. Right. I see Anne Marie Miller um, commenting uh, that, uh, that, that sometimes local arts commissions and local arts councils can help as an intermediary between artists, community and government. Um, and Antoinette uh, was kind of aiming in uh, Roland said that um, uh, it's a platform to communicate and bring the community together along with law enforcement to educate each group. So I want to give um, uh, just anyone else that is here in our audience, if there's any other questions you want to um, put to our panelists before I ask my last, um, you can either put them in the chat or you can put them um, into the Q&A. So I want to make sure everybody who has a burning question uh, for any of these um, fine experts, um, I want you to be able to have a chance to get those out there. Okay, so um, I have a last question for each of you. Um, you know, when we're all going somewhere, you know, you, you, you get super excited, especially now that the things are opening up just a bit with this pandemic, and we might be able to get in our cars and drive around or, or take a little mini vacation here or two. Um, and you know, you call up your friend and you say, I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Um, or, I'm looking to take a vacation, just get away for a day. You got any suggestions? You know, any good things that I should make sure that I see or go to? Um, if we think about this topic of art as activism, and you think about the places, the things that pop into your head, the things that you know, uh, where would you suggest that um, I start my tour? Um, if I were to go and try to visit um, or experience some art in any of the types of venues, whether it's music or, or murals or sculpture or poetry or whatever it is. Um, when you think about art as activism, how would, I, how would I build my tour? What would be your suggestion? Something. Um, does anybody have a, uh, well, I mean, if we're talking about Trenton, I would say to check out the Black Lives Matter uh, mural project on the exterior of the Artworks building, which is right across from the DMV. Um, that was a, uh, a good partnership between uh, four different painters and the photographer who took the actual photos. So you can see um, sort of like really amazing images of like pride and, um, and activism and then also see like from an artistic standpoint you can see how four different artists interpret the, the work of, of a fifth artist basically so even though everybody's working from the same photos there's something different stylistically and, and like message wise in each one of those so I would tell everybody to go check that out if you haven't already. Okay. 
So I feel like this could be like a, <laughs> um, advertisement for everybody, right? Let me hit it. Let me just back it down. So you're coming into Trent. Which way are you coming? 295 Route 1? What are we doing? You want to yeah. stop at Artworks? Go in Artworks. Check out the mural. Go inside. Check out the studios there. Then maybe you can walk up. And I think where Casa Cultura was now, which is the fishbowl, is in the fishbowl now, right? You can go to Mill Hill, have yourself a, a beer, some food, whatever. Listen to some music there. And then across is the fishbowl gallery, right? I believe, then you can walk yeah. right downtown to the New Jersey State Museum. You might want to hit the candlelight at some point. Am I missing places? I feel like I'm missing a couple of places throughout the you way. At, you got to stop at Passage and see the Passage, <laughs> question the whole, like get in there, you know, and then throughout the way, you'll definitely see murals all through the, through the city. So then you can take a look at all the work that all the artists have done. And I'm sure there's a lot more places that I'm not thinking about right now. Um, but I just wanted to make one more comment because I just had a quick thought. Yes. Turn up the um, for policy, someone was talking about policy and like the city, what we need, what the artists need, all the mural artists, the artists, people that are actually creating these changes, people that are working really hard is support from the city. And that's all I have to say. I'm, I don't want to like get into it. Once, when you get that really stable, good support, like the, all the bigger cities have, New York, Philly, everyone else, this is gonna be unstoppable. But first we need that support. Thank you. So vote. There you go. Allison, do you wanna close this out? Yeah, I guess I would say like my, um, my kind of dream thing is a little bit still aspirational. But what I love to do is um, I like to walk the, it's kind of, maybe you'd say it's almost like performance uh, art in my mind. Like when you walk the paths that you know were important in these past protests that I've talked about that, you know, had a lot of meaning and we can bring out the meaning. Like we know that there was a hunger strike here and there was a march of high school students here and there was picketing there and like I feel when we ever, when we teach courses that um, focus on Trenton, that one of the most, most fun things is walking the city with the students and, you know, picking a different theme every time. And sometimes it's about, like I was saying before, like those really good ideas that people have, um, you know, like the rescue mission right now has this amazing idea for, um, you know, developing some public land into a, a park. And so like, but that's like aspirational, right? You're like helping people focus on what could be as well as like what has been accomplished in the past or, or maybe just to be remembered from the past that otherwise is not visible. But, but like when you know the history, you can, you can make it visible. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you to each of our panelists and each of the things that you shared. Um, and thank you to everyone who was able to join 